Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله السميع العليم من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين ولا عدوان إلا على الظالمين والعاقبة المتقين اللهم صل وسلم وبارك على عبدك ورسولك محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا. Um, first and foremost, I want to uh, thank the sisters for having me. May Allah subhanahu wa taala bless you. Mashallah, this is one of the most um, successful, I think, groups of, of learning that we have going on in the country right now, which is the Ikna Sisters Wing. So I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to put more barakah in it, inshallah, and to continue to allow you all to grow in ikhlas and kamila, which is pure sincerity, uh, ilm and nafi'ah, which is beneficial knowledge, and amal and salihah, which is righteous deeds. Uh, the sister said this will be a very beautiful lecture. It's not a beautiful lecture at all. It's actually a very scary lecture because we're talking about riba. And the Prophet ﷺ, he said that there would come a time where everyone would be touched by the dust of riba, where even if you try to avoid it completely, uh, you'll still find that you will be touched by it. So I hope that it's, it's something that we all take heed from. Uh, because living in this country, which in, in essence the banking system of, of the United States is, is completely based on interest, completely based on riba, it's important for us to try to fulfill what Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, Allah to fear Allah as much as we can to try to avoid it. So I'm going to have a disclaimer from the very beginning of this lecture that you will not be able to completely 100% avoid riba. وَلَكِنْ لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وَسْعَاهَا Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not burden a soul beyond its scope. Ironically, uh, as Imam al-Shawkani rahimahullah said, the verse, لَا يُكَلِّفُ اللَّهُ نَفْسًا إِلَّا وَسْعَاهَا is only a few verses after the verses of interest. Uh, so in particular, I think that we, can, we find that we're able to run away from, from the crime of zina as much as possible, but naturally as times go on, uh, we're aff afflicted by these things to some extent. So for example, on television, uh, we might be watching television, and unfortunately the zina of the eyes is looking. So you'll have people watching uh, a woman that is half naked as a family together, and it's become something that's completely normal. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. Uh, every single aspect of the major sins, to an extent we are afflicted by it. Uh, many times in our foods and our drinks, we might not realize that we're consuming some of khamr, we're consuming alcohol. And I'm not saying that, that we should become paranoid about our food, but at the same time, uh, we live in a time where we even have to investigate that, where something that looks as innocent as a chocolate bar might have alcohol in it. So we find from al-mubiqat, which are what the Prophet ﷺ called the seven major sins, we find that we are unfortunately tested with a little bit of each and every single one of them. But as far as al-riba is concerned, I would definitely say al-riba is the most underestimated of all of those sins. Now, first and foremost, I want to take a Qur'anic look at this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, before the ayah of riba, in Surah Al-Baqarah, verse 275, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ بِاللَّيْلِ وَالنَّهَارِ سِرًّا وَعَلَانِيًا فَلَهُمْ أَجْرُهُمْ عِنْدَ رَبِّهِمْ وَلَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ Those who spend their wealth in Allah's way, by night and by day, secretly and publicly, they will have their reward with their Lord and no fear will, will, will there be concerning them, nor will they grieve. With the ayat of riba, the very next ayah, الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ riba, Those who consume riba. What we see in these in the sequence of seven, eight ayat, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions a verse of sadaqah, a verse of riba, a verse of sadaqah, a verse of riba. And the reason being is to show that a system can survive without riba. Usually if you have this conversation with, with an economist uh, about riba, they would say the world cannot survive without interest. But actually, Islamic systems have proved to be more successful. The reason being is that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala encourages good, goodwill. Goodwill to this extent. So, yunfiquna amwalahum sirra wa alaniya, ana alayli wa nahar. You know, day and night, meaning they're consistently engaged, sirra wa alaniya, secretly and publicly, they're consistently engaged in giving sadaqah so that the welfare is being taken care of. Because the person who gives sadaqah sees it as a burden on himself. He sees the money that comes to him as a burden on him and he has to take care of others so people are not are not placed in a situation where they have to be enslaved by loans, where they have to be enslaved by things of that sort. So we find Al-Qadi Abu Yusuf, Al-Qadi Abu Yusuf, the great student of Imam Abu Hanifa, may Allah be pleased with them both, he wrote a book called Kitab Al-Haraj. 
the book of taxes. We find Islamic finance did not just start as a response to riba. Okay, Islamic finance is not reactionary. Islamic finance defines some of the most important concepts we have in finance today. So for example, price ceilings and price floors. Um, that the market, that people in the market should not, you know, that there should be a limit uh, to how much they can raise up the prices and how low they can go. So that both supply and demand, the suppliers and the consumers are being taken care of, they're being looked out after. The first person to write in regards to price ceilings and price floors was none other than Shaykh al-Islam ibn Taymiyyah rahimahullah. Imam ibn Taymiyyah wrote in his majmu' lots of, of discussion on this topic. So we find our scholars have defined uh, pure and good accounting practices, pure and good financial practices. And so that's how we counter riba before it starts, by taking care of people. Uh, so that people are not, so that the student who wants to learn has people that are taking care of him already out of goodwill. Abdullah ibn Mubarak rahimahullah used to finance all of the students of knowledge around the world. He found that if, if anyone needs to learn, he takes care of them on a purely interest-free loan. In fact, sometimes he would give from his zakat for them if they, were, if they met the, the requirements of zakat. So that takes care of student loans. We find as early as Al-Imam al, um, al Al-Zarkashi talking about the importance of sponsoring people who are looking to get married. Right? The, so all of these issues are taken care of in an Islamic environment to the point that as we know the Prophet ﷺ said there would come a time where the zakat collectors would go out giving money and they would not find anyone to give zakat to. And we know this is Isa alayhi salam. And this happened one time before Isa alayhi salam. And what was that time? In whose khilafah? That the zakat collector went even to the, to the depths of Africa, all over the world looking for people to give zakat to and could not find anyone. Does anyone know? Umar ibn Abdul Aziz rahimahullah ta'ala. No one was to be found that needed zakah. So in essence, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off introducing the topic of riba in this way. Then after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, الَّذِينَ يُنْفِقُونَ أَمْوَالَهُمْ Allah says, الَّذِينَ يَأْكُلُونَ الرِّبَا لَا يَقُومُونَ إِلَّا كَمَا يَقُومُ الَّذِي يَتَخَبَّطُهُ الشَّيْطَانُ مِنَ الْمَسْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, those who consume interest, will not be able to stand on the Day of Judgment except as the one who stands who is being beaten by shaitan into insanity. This is how he will be raised. You know, when we are raised from our graves, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, the one who is being raised, who consumed riba, he will be being beaten to a point of insanity, to a point of almost unconsciousness. ذَلِكَ بِأَنَّهُمْ قَالُوا إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الْرِبَا That is because they say trade is like interest. Al-bay' is just like riba. There is no difference between buying and selling, and there is no difference between riba. So in essence, what you will find is everyone who, who uses riba within the community of believers justifies it by saying it's all the same thing. You know, this person is going from this door, this person is going from that door. Al-bay' مِثْلُ الْرِبَا So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying that they that they are dulling their senses in this dunya, so Allah will dull their senses in akhirah by saying, إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الْرِبَا وَأَحَلَّ اللَّهُ الْبَيْعُ وَحَرَّمَ الْرِبَا And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made permissible trade, but He forbade riba. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and I'll just, I'll, I'll move forward, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ الْرِبَا وَيُرْبِ الصَّدَقَاتِ Allah destroys riba, and He increases in a sadaqah. We'll talk about this inshallah. Wallahu la yuhibbu kullu kaffarin athim. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala does not love every sinning disbeliever. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala compares the two. Al riba was sadaqa. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala again goes back to the believer. Inna alladheena amanu wa aminu salihah wa aqamu salah wa atu al zakah. Lahum ajruhum inda rabbihim wa la khawfun alayhim wa lahum yahzanun. Allah switches back to the believer. Those who believe and do righteous deeds and establish the prayer, and they give zakah, will have the reward with their Lord, and they won't have to fear. So the people that avoid a riba in essence, the people that do what they are commanded to do, and avoid a riba Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, لَا خَوْفٌ عَلَيْهِمْ وَلَا هُمْ يَحْزَنُونَ On the day of judgment, they have nothing to worry about, uh, nor, shall, nor will they grieve. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, after giving the command to abandon riba, says, فَإِن لَمْ تَفْعَلُوا فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبٍ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ 
This is a scary, scary, scary ayah. Allah says, if you don't do away with riba, instead of لا خوف عليهم ولا هم يحزنون, you know, you, you sell your, your, your dunya, you sell your akhirah for something small from the dunya, just to have a house, just to have a car in this world. And you destroy your akhirah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, so on that day, instead of being like the people who avoided riba, and don't have to have any fear, and don't have to grieve, فَأْذَنُوا بِحَرْبِ مِنَ اللَّهِ وَرَسُولِهِ be ready for a war, a harb, a war, an all-out war with Allah and His Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abdullah ibn Abbas sallallahu anhu says that when the person who consumed riba is brought forth on the Day of Judgment, he will be beaten by the angels until he loses his senses and then he will be told to take his weapons. Subhanallah, to take his weapons because he is at war with Allah and there is no other person that will be in the situation except for akilul riba the one who consumed riba. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, not even the kafir, not even the disbeliever would be told, would be addressed with such humiliation. Take your weapons and you are going to fight with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to protect us. Also we see in the ahadith of the Prophet sallallahu in the hadith of Jabir radiallahu ta'ala anhu, Rasulullah sallallahu says, لَعَنَ اللَّهُ أَخِذَ riba." May Allah curse the one who takes riba wa mukilahu wa katibahu wa shahidahu, the one who borrows it, the one who witnesses it, and the one who writes it. And Rasulullah sallallahu said, wa hum fil wizri sawa, wa hum fil wizri sawa, and they are on the scale all equal. The one who gives it, the one who takes it, the one who witnesses it, the one who writes it. Hum fil wizri sawa. Am I speaking too fast for you? طيب الحمد لله. Because I have a lot of material to cover, so I, I feel uh, under pressure. Um, in essence, so we, we go back when we introduce these things. A riba, the reason why it's so underestimated is because of the following reasons. Number one, it does not have the disgusting connotations or consequences that the other mubiqat, that the other major sins do. Right? So when someone commits zina, it creates a societal abomination. When someone drinks, it creates a societal abomination. But when someone deals with riba, it's something in money and it's something in transactions. And that's why it's very, very, very hard to truly look at it in the same light. But the Prophet ﷺ, um, he said in an authentic hadith narrated by Musnad and Imam Ahmad, he said, one dirham, a dirham is like a penny. A dirham is like a penny, it's the smallest coin in their currency. One dirham of riba eaten by man is more severe than 36 acts of fornication with a person's mother. 36 acts of zina with a person's mother. One dirham, one penny of riba wal billah. So next, when you see something in your bank account, five dollars worth of riba, Rasulullah said that's 500 times 36 times worse than zina with a person's mother. It's a very serious uh, crime. Al-Aswad ibn Salim, Al-Aswad ibn Salim, one of the great tabi'een, rahimahullah, he said, I would rather commit any one of the mubiqat, any one of the major sins, before I would commit riba, before I would be guilty of riba, because of the severity of the warning from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Why is it so serious and why is it so condemned? Um, number one, the entire economic crisis that we see today is because of riba. In essence, riba creates this bubble. Everybody is building on debt, 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 debt. So this entire bubble is being created. Within a small amount of time, the bubble becomes poked and everything collapses. And we see that the entire economy collapses. Uh, if you look at student loans, for example, uh, the amount of student loans in this country is over $280 billion. $280 billion. Uh, within 11 years, it's expected to be over a trillion dollars. All of the people in debt um, in that regard. So in, in essence, it, it truly creates... And subhanAllah, Imam al-Baghawi rahimahullah, he says something very important. He says that when, when the economy is bad, <laughs> and this is so true, he says, and it's true in modern times also, says when people are being cheated with their money, they become more susceptible to drinking, and they become more susceptible to zina, they become more susceptible to sin, uh, to, to theft, to sariqah, to murder. So in essence, when the economy collapses, all of that starts to increase. And that's, that's visible today in the country as we see today. 
when, when the economy collapses, people are more susceptible to all of the rest of the major sins. Uh, also, the Messenger of Allah وسلم, said, and I forgot to mention this, an authentic hadith in Al-Bukhari, he said in, in, the, in the narration, the long narration of Adab al-Qabr, that we came to a red river-like blood, and I saw a man swimming in, and another one on the river bank had gathered many stones. So when the swimmer is in this river of blood, and he starts swimming towards the man on the river bank, when he gets to him, he opens his mouth, and the other one throws a stone in his mouth, and it sends him way back into the puddle of blood. And he keeps on doing this until the Day of Judgment. Some of the scholars, they, made, um, they, they, they analyzed this hadith. They said, because the one who is, who is participating in riba is drowning people in dunya and their debt, so likewise, he would be made to drown in a pool of blood until he reaches Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, the linguistic meaning, so to, to understand this also, the linguistic meaning of the word riba is very, very similar to zakah. Riba means increase. Riba means increase. Zakah also means increase. Okay, so they both mean increase. But the difference between the two, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَمْحَقُ اللَّهُ riba wa يُرْبِسْ صَدَقَاتِ Allah destroys riba. As we see today, Allah destroys interest and He makes sadaqah profitable. Zakah has two meanings to it. Zakah has also the meaning of purity. Purity and growth. Zakah means increase, but it also means purity. As far as the riba is concerned, Rasulullah sallallahu said in an authentic hadith, narrated by Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu ta'ala anhu, in Sunan ibn, uh, ibn Majah, Rasulullah said, No one takes riba except that it will eventually lead him to poverty. Anyone who deals in riba will eventually be led to poverty. So this is true in the case of, of uh, many situations that we witness around us. Eventually he will be led to poverty, whereas the Prophet said, As far as all sadaqah is concerned, مَا نَقَصَ مَالٌ مِنْ صَدَقَةٌ Money is never decreased by the giving of sadaqah, by the giving of charity. Okay, so we see um, the growth of sadaqah and zakah, the destruction of riba. So even though, and, and this is talking about in dunya by the way, this isn't talking about necessarily in akhirah. In akhirah he's got to deal with something, but in dunya, he also finds himself in that terrible situation. Now why is it that the dust of riba has touched everyone today? Look at the hadith of the Prophet Akhirul riba. Generally the banks are the ones who take riba, right? The borrowers, mukilu riba. Usually that's us. That's everyone who goes to the bank to take. Who are the witnesses? Shahiduha. You have the lawyers, you have the notary publics, you have the accountants, you have all of the professions that document these things. So, documenting of riba. Then you have katibuha, the clerk who even writes the receipts. Okay, all of these people are involved in some way, shape, or form with riba. If you have a credit card, if you have a bank account, somehow you're going to be involved in riba. Um, and, and subhanAllah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has prohibited, it's not that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has only prohibited it for Muslims, but Allah tells us in the Qur'an that all of the previous generations, all of the previous ummah were prohibited from riba. They were also prohibited from interest. So the tashri' the legislation of Musa alayhi salam, the legislation of Isa alayhi salam, all of it contained the prohibition of riba. And in fact, uh, what caused the, the anti-Semitism in Germany in the first place was the fact that the Jews in Germany started to deal with riba. They started to deal with interest, whereas the Catholic Church at that time still had prohibited it. It's not justifying the Holocaust in any way, but this, this allowed for the rise in anti-Semitism in Germany. Why? Because one group of people took advantage at that point, or some of that group of people took advantage of the banking system in that regard. And then obviously as we know today, the Christians and the Jews, no religious leader, except for some of the, the Hasidic Jews, some of the Orthodox Jews say that riba is haram. But it is haram in their books also. Um, but still with that we see obviously riba has found itself uh, incorporated in every single aspect of the financial system in the United States today. Uh, so inshallah ta'ala, I'll go through a, a brief overview. I'm sure we have a lot of questions, so I'll give time for questions more than, more than speaking. And I'll just gener cover the general concepts of riba. Uh, and then inshallah ta'ala, we can have specific questions. And if I can answer, I'm telling you from now, there will be questions where I will say, I don't know. Because there are very sensitive issues right now 
um, in the discussion of what is financially a, a halal transaction, a haram transaction. If I know the answer, I will say it. If I don't, then I will, I will defer. Uh, first and foremost, uh, riba is of two types. Riba is of two types. There is interest which, in, which includes a surplus, okay, a surplus, and there is interest which includes a delay. Surplus and delay. So for example, in an interest that includes a riba, that includes surplus, okay, it's when you exchange specific commodities, specific things, one of them has more value than the other. So to explain this, Rasulullah said in an authentic hadith in Sahih Muslim, he said, gold is to be paid for by gold. Silver for silver, wheat by wheat, barley by barley, dates by dates, and salt by salt. Again, six categories. Gold is to be paid for by gold. Silver for silver, wheat for wheat, barley for barley, dates by dates, and salt by salt. Rasulullah said, like for like and equal for equal. Yani kullun sawa, they are, everything is equal. And then he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, payment should be made hand to hand. So he's, he's emphasizing fair trade here. Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, he who makes an addition to it, or asks for an addition, deals in riba. He who makes an addition to that, or asks for an addition, deals in riba. And he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the receiver and the giver are equally guilty. So when someone says, I'm not giving riba, I'm just participating, I have no... No, you are equally guilty when you are the giver or when you are the receiver. Okay. So amongst these six categories, we can divide, the scholars then divide these six categories into two. There is that which is monetary, gold and silver. Gold and silver. And then there are four which are non-perishable goods. Non-perishable goods, which are the barley, the dates, the salt, and the wheat. So it's two categories there. Monetary items and non-perishable goods. Uh, and in essence, what that means, as far as an increase of that, number one, uh, because there's there's important important concept here in fiqh. If a creditor loans, just a simple example, if a creditor loans uh, $200 to someone, but accepts $195 in return, then that's okay to take less. But to take more is not okay, or to ask for more is not okay. If, if a person though gives you, because sometimes in our fear of riba, there's something that's halal, which is if a person gives you $40, or gives you $39, okay, let's be more realistic, gives you $39, or pays for something for $39. And when you go to pay them back, you take out your wallet and you give them two 20s and you say, don't worry about it, that's fine inshallah, because it was not expected on behalf of the seller or the buyer, so that is ihsan on your part. That's ihsan, you don't have to worry about that. Okay, so no one will be punished uh, for that. So, case one within these categories, let's look at some various cases inshallah ta'ala to understand this, and then we'll bring it to a more modern understanding in terms of how we deal with currency. So the first, the first thing, so we said there are, there are six different items, and they are divided into two categories. So the first case of trade, of al-bay'ah, is between something that is the same category and the same item. Same category, same item. So for example, exchanging gold for gold, dollar for dollar, dirham for dirham, silver for silver, when you exchange the same item for the same item. If you do that, it has to meet the following conditions. It has to be of the exact same amount. So it has to be of the exact same amount. If it's dealt with in gold, the same weight. Okay, now we deal with paper currency, obviously. Same weight, same amount. Number two, the other condition, the exchange cannot be delayed, or it would be considered riba. It has to be an immediate exchange. It has to be an immediate exchange. Of course, this is not the case you know, of, of, a, of a pure loan though, of a pure loan where I will give you this and you pay me back later, but this is an exchange between the two. Uh, the exchange should be immediate between the contracting parties at the same time. So they have to exchange it at the same time. Okay? So this is if it's gold for gold. So let's say for example, you want to buy 
20 pounds, or not, no one buys 20, 20 ounces of gold for, you know, 20 ounces of a gold bracelet with 20 ounces of pure gold. You cannot say because this gold is crafted and it's nice, it's 20 ounces, I have to give you 25 ounces of gold. Because it's gold and it's gold. Otherwise, it's riba. So I mean, I know, I'm just trying to give you a better understanding of this, this idea, what the scholars meant by that. Okay, even though it's crafted gold, you can't say, for example, um, that uh, you know your dollar bill is newer than my dollar bill. Okay, so you have a twenty dollar bill that's from the new ones. I have the older twenty dollar bill, so I'll give you twenty one dollars to give me that twenty. That would be haram. That would be haram. Um, as far as the as far but as far as the same category but different item is concerned. So gold and silver are in one category. Wheat, barley, dates, and salt are in the other category. Uh, you can exchange a different amount between the two. So for example, someone could exchange uh, a gold bracelet that is 20 ounces for a silver necklace that is 40 ounces. That's halal. So you can exchange two different currencies. Okay, some people think currency exchange is haram. It's not haram to exchange currencies, to pay a little bit. So you can shop your currency in Islam. It's halal to shop the best rate for your currency. Okay, when you, when you go to an airport sometimes and you want to see the rates, that's halal to try to shop the best exchange rate because none of them will be exact anyway. Uh, but, the, but the conditions of that, the exchange should not be delayed and the exchange should be immediate. Okay, so also whenever you're exchanging silver for gold, or dollar for dirham, or dollar for, for whatever it is, it's going to be, it has to be at the same time, it has to be immediate. So you cannot place an order for, for dirhams, for example, you cannot charge your credit card for $20 in exchange for 100 dirhams later on. That's not allowed. Uh, case three, different category, different item. Different category, different item. So for example, uh, gold for dates, money for dates. So with money for dates, the quantity can be totally different. So you can charge, someone can charge you whatever they want to for that box of dates. At the same time, it does not have to be an immediate exchange. So you can make an order for something and you can receive it uh, later. Okay. So that's, the, that's how we deal with the riba in terms of exchange on commodities. Now that is a very rare type of riba that we have today. Right? We don't really see that much today. But the other type of riba which is in delayed payment is what we see today. Okay? So the first, so this is where we really need to pay attention. The first is riba on a mature loan. Riba on a loan. So for example, a loan is given with a date and if you pass that date you have to pay a late fee. This is the asl, this is the origin of riba. This is how the Arabs used to practice riba. A late fee, by the way, a late penalty, a late charge, is riba according to the consensus of the scholars. There is no difference of opinion amongst the madhahib on late fees. It is riba, pure riba. That is what the Arabs used to say. They used to say, give me some more time and I'll increase your return. Give me some more time and I'll increase your return. Okay, so an example of that also in terms of our modern dealings, a charge card. Not a credit card, a charge card. A charge card, you can, you, know, you can charge as much as you want, but if you can't pay it, then your, your penalty will be increased more and more and more and more. But there is no set interest fee there, but it will continue to be increased. As far as riba is concerned on a deferred loan, on a deferred loan. So there are loans, there are loans whose principal, which is the amount that's owed, and interest are determined from the very start. Okay, and you will be paying that loan over a certain amount of time. So for example, a credit card, a mortgage, okay, um, a student loan, if an unsubsidized student loan, whatever, you know, you will be paying. So a subsidized student loan falls into the first category, right? A subsidized student loan where you have six months where you won't be charged interest. If you, over, if you go over that six months, then you will have to pay interest. An unsubsidized loan is even worse. Okay, where there's a set interest fee from the very beginning. So again, credit cards, mortgages, car loans, whatever it may be. Where I will give you $200,000, you give me in return $250,000. Whether we split this up over monthly installments or whether you give it to me now, then, um, then it's, it's still going to be riba. Okay. 
Now, when you give someone a loan, the reason why this is so haram, to show you the extent of condemnation here. Ali ibn Abi Talib radiallahu anhu said, every loan which brings about benefit is riba. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah, he once loaned someone some money. And he was passing through his, his, uh, his shade, his trees, his garden. And his companions went and sat under the tree and he didn't sit under the tree. He said, because if I benefit from his shade after I gave him that loan, it's riba. SubhanAllah, look how careful the scholars were in that regard. Rasulullah Wasallam said in an authentic hadith from Anas ibn Malik, when one of you gives a loan and the borrower offers you a dish, he should not accept it. And if the borrower offers a ride on an animal, he should not ride unless the two of them have, a, have been accustomed to previously exchanging favors. So this is the savior, this is this. You know, one time um, I gave a loan, uh, I gave a loan to a brother and I invited him to my house and he said, I can't eat from you. I said, why? He said, because you gave me a loan. I said, well, Rasulullah said, if you were accustomed to this before, it's not a problem. So if you're friends, which is usually the case of giving loans to each other, if you're friends and you always give each other, you always invite each other to each other's homes and things of that sort, then it's not riba. But, but if there's an extra added benefit, if all of a sudden the one who received the loan is saying, you know, you can borrow my car for a day, you can go to my vacation home for a day, and instead of just serving biryani, he's serving kulfi and kir now also with it, then that's a problem. You're adding on to it and it's obvious, it's understood. And that's what Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah was... was um, was afraid of also from even taking the shade because he said, had I not given him the loan, I wouldn't have even known this person. Right? This was a person that Imam Muhanif rahimahullah met for the first time when he gave him uh, that loan. So this is, again, ex anything that is excessive over the money. Money for money and it's excessive becomes riba uh, today. And Rasul, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya ayyuhal ladheena amanu la ta'kulu riba adha'afan mudha'afa. O oh, you who believe, do not consume riba doubled or redoubled. Meaning, riba only becomes compounded. So the most evil form of interest is compounded interest. When it's interest upon interest upon interest, it only, again, the bubble, the bubble continues to get bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Rasulullah uh, or Allah Azza wa Jal, I'm sorry, banned a riba much earlier than he banned the other sins. So the prohibition, when was the legislation of hijab? Does anyone know when the legislation of hijab was? Four years after hijrah. Four years after hijrah. The ban on riba came two years after hijrah. The ban on, on riba came two years after hijrah. Okay, around the time of the battle of Uhud. This was the revelation of, uh, of Surah Al-Baqarah. Okay. Um, so we have some questions that come in regards there. So I'll address some of the modern day issues now. Okay. If you make a contract with someone, and in that contract, which is very customary in the United States, in that contract, it says, so for example, on your credit card, on your car, if you don't pay back this amount within this amount of time, you're going to be charged such and such, or your, your loan will start to be compounded with 5% or whatever it is. Is it impermissible to make that contract? If you know for a fact, there are two conditions that have to be met there. Number one, it's a need. It's a need. You needed to go into that contract for a haja. For a haja. I don't know if, if you all took the maqasd al sharia, but in Islam there are three levels of need. There is darura, daruriyat, darura, which is absolute dire need. Dire need. You cannot survive without it. Haja something you need, but at the same time you can live without it. Technically speaking, you can live without it. Okay, so for example, you could eat the same food every day, but it would be extremely inconvenient to eat the same food every single day. You would need to diversify your, your meals. And tahsiniyat. Tahsiniyat are supplements, are things that make things, that make life easier. Okay, they make life easier, but a person can live a comfortable life without them. Alright? So, if the, if the loan that you need to take, or if the car, for example, you need to buy a car. You need to buy something and it has this, this six month clause on it. If you have a haja for it, then it's permissible to go in it. That's the first condition, if you have a haja. Secondly, if you know for a fact that you will be able to pay it back, and if you can't pay it back, you have someone who will guarantee the payment for you. So for example, you speak to someone, you speak to another Muslim,
Some of the scholars put this condition, and to be honest with you, I favor it because our, our financial circumstances change so frequently. We don't know. You know, I might be able to pay it back fully. I might go into this contract knowing I can pay it back. Some of the scholars added the stipulation, you should talk to another person who can also guarantee the loan for you, who can say, look, if, if, if for some reason you fall short with this, I'll take care of it in the short run and then you can, and then you can pay me back instead so that you don't incur riba, so that you don't incur interest. I believe this is a condition. I think we should do this. Anytime we go into a contract like that, we should have a guarantee or we should have someone who would be willing to back up the loan. The reason why the scholars say it's permissible in the first place, uh, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, so the books of fiqh always mention this, Aisha radiallahu ta'ala anha, she once wanted to free a slave girl by the name of Barira. Barira. Barira was, was, a, slave, was a slave who Aisha radiallahu anha saw much good inside of her. Um, and actually we, we, we read later on in, in the ahadith that Barira used to lead Aisha in salah, in salah uh, holding the mushaf, she would lead Aisha in salah in Ramadan and Qiyam, so on and so forth. So Barira was, was a righteous woman, a woman who was scholarly. Uh, and Aisha wanted to free her, but whenever she came to free her, the people that wanted to, the people that that owned her, they said that will free her on the condition that once she beca- that once you pass away, her loyalty is to us. Once you pass away, her loyalty comes back to us. So Aisha went back to the Prophet ﷺ and she asked the Prophet ﷺ, "What should I do?" And the Prophet ﷺ said. You can make the contract to free her anyway because the condition they are placing is null and void. It's batil, it's facet. It's, it's not a, a, an appropriate condition because once you purchase, then that's it. So in essence, what the scholars say here is that whenever you go into a contract and you know that this condition is one that you won't have to resort to anyway, because Aisha radiallahu anha did not intend to keep her as a slave anyway, was to free her anyway. If you know that you will not be affected and harmed by that condition, then it's okay to go into that contract. Okay, but as we said, as far as late fees are concerned, as far as late fees are concerned, it is by unanimous agreement haram. By unanimous agreement riba. And there are other ways, I know that many times we find Islamic organizations work with late fees and things of that sort. There are many other ways to deal with a person who's not paying their fees. So you can cancel their membership, you can cancel enrollment. Um, you could try to collect the fund today we see through lawyers or whatever it is you don't have to put on someone late fees you don't have because this is what the scholars call riba al-jahiliyyah late fees literally is the, is the riba of the people of ignorance the, the days of ignorance okay another so another um, obviously the main thing is the house issue how much time do I have left is anyone keeping time I wasn't keeping time how much 20 minutes? Okay. Tayyib. Um, the first thing is with credit cards. So we go to credit cards. Credit cards are something that, that truly have caused the scholars uh, you know, a lot of trouble because the concept of the credit cards is, is truly problematic. And some of the scholars, like for example, that Imam Ibn Uthaymin, rahimahullah, in 1993 he gave a fatwa was haram, in 1998 he gave a fatwa was halal. He changed his fatwa on that. A lot of the scholars changed their opinions on the credit cards because it's become sort of a necessity to have a line of credit and things of that sort. Um, so can you take out a credit card that gives you back cash back in accordance with the first type of riba that we talked about? Can you take a credit card that gives you cash back as a reward? No, you cannot. Cash back? Points? Cash back. I'll, I'll talk about the difference between the two. Cash back because it's the same currency for the same return. You're paying this amount, you're getting this much because you're using that line of money. So giving, taking out a credit card that gives you cash back rewards is not allowed. Taking out a credit card that gives you airline mileage, gift cards, hotel rewards, all of those things, that's all fine. That's all permissible. Because it's a different category. <laughs> Don't worry about it. <laughs> I fly all the, I need these types of things, okay, so points, rental cars, airline tickets, hotels, recreation, whatever it is, Sky Mall, gift, whatever it is, that's fine as long as it's not within the same currency, but you cannot have a credit card that says, spend a thousand dollars, you get fifty dollars back for every one thousand you spend. That is riba, that's increase without justification, money on money. Right, with the cashback, you can have the credit card. 
But you cannot exercise the cashback option. So, you know, you can put it into gift cards or whatever it is. I know even those cards that say cashback. But I mean, to take just pure money credited back to your account because you spent $1,000 would not be permissible. So you're saying that if they put it in the gift card, that's permissible? That's fine. If it's in the gift card, because again, remember we talked about six items, two categories. Exchange between two items within the same category is fine in different quantities. That's fine. So exchanging gold for silver with a greater amount of gold or a greater amount of silver is fine. But exchanging gold for gold, money for money. But isn't it the same thing? They didn't give me the cash, but they just put the cash in the card. Well, you pay, you're, you're using the card. So for example, I have a balance of 1,000 and then it became 950 because I exercised the cash back reward and I credited $50 back to my account. So that's why, what's that? To pay for my bill. To pay for my bill, right? But to put it towards anything else is fine. To exercise the $50 for anything else is fine. But don't exercise it towards just to your balance the same way you spent it. Then it becomes the first riba al-fadl, which the Prophet ﷺ said, exercising exchange of commodities. Yes, sister. Doesn't that promote the practice of riba itself? If you encourage these companies to do that type of transaction, then you're purchasing their commodities, and then you're giving cash back. So they're promoting your business. They are uh, encouraging you to do this transaction. That's why I'm saying we shouldn't do it. <laughs> That's so, but what I'm saying is if you have a credit card that has rewards and those types of things, if you use the rewards towards other things, that's fine. Uh, but we should not go, and, and this is where we get a little bit extreme. There are people that you'll find today that still have no credit cards, but there are people today that will go and open 10, 15 credit cards just to exercise rewards. We have resorted to credit cards because it's a necessity, not because we approve of the system. Not because we approve of the system. Also bank accounts. Right? There's some people that still say you have to keep your money, but it's not reasonable. Okay, we're in a haja. It's not reasonable to say you just have to keep your money and not put it in a bank account because of what the bank will do. Uh, but at the same time, don't go overboard with, with all of these different bank accounts and, uh, and things of that sort. So we, again, it's, it's permissible, but it should not be expanded. Should, we should not go to the other extreme of excess. Okay, now as far as um, the housing is concerned, because I know this is a very, very, very touchy, controversial, sensitive issue. I'm not going to endorse any companies, I promise you. I don't, I'm not going to endorse any companies today. But at the same time, I hope that you'll be able to take this and you'll be able to exercise your best judgment. Um, number one, we know that there's the fatwa, that you, can, that you can buy a house on a conventional mortgage if it's your first home. Uh, this fatwa was expanded. Unfortunately, the fatwa started off with, with the people who truly do have darura, who truly do have a dire need, which were people that have five, six, seven children and no one is willing to rent a house to them, except that's something that's abnormal. Fine, for those people, yes, they can exercise that option. They had the fatwa to go and, and to just exercise a conventional mortgage. Okay? But to expand that to everyone on the concept that it is a darura, that it is a dire need to own a house in this country is not appropriate. It's not true. It's not a dire need. We can live with, a, there are people that live on rent and lease their entire lives. And if, we, if everyone exercised that, then there would be no development of Islamic alternatives. There would be no development of us Islamic alternatives. Because people insist on not paying riba, you find even HSBC and even conventional banks are trying, Devon banks are trying, to, to find an Islamically compatible package. So if we didn't, if all of us just said, okay, let's just lay down and take the conventional mortgage, it's darura, you know, a sheikh gave a fatwa, it's okay. Then subhanAllah, we're destroying our future as a community. We're destroying our future as a community. So no, it's not okay for, for anyone to just go for a conventional mortgage if it's their first house. Because it is no, in no way, shape or form a darura. The other excuse that's used is that we live in Dar al-Harb. We live in, in, in uh, enemy territory. And because of that, Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, if you live in Dar al-Harb, you could deal in riba. If you benefit, you can benefit from riba. Now, for, first and foremost, so Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said that if you live, and he was, this was his opinion, and it's not the majority opinion, but it's his opinion, so we respect the opinion, but it doesn't apply here. Imam Abu Hanifa rahimahullah said, if a person lives in Dar al-Harb, I'm going to explain what enemy territory is in a minute. In Dar al-Harb, they are allowed to benefit from the interest of the people. Not to give, but to benefit. Who benefits from interest here, right? 
So they're allowed to benefit from the interest, the, the interest system, because they're living in Dar al-Harb, in essence, in enemy territory, they need to build themselves up uh, by any means necessary, because there's a sense of urgency there. We do not live in Dar al-Harb. Because if you want to open up that door and say, we live in Dar al-Harb, that means it's haram to get citizenship. How many people that do we see today that buy houses on riba, but would, not, would refuse to get citizenship? Right? So we can't play the, the pick and choose convenience fatwa game here. Okay, if you wanted to open up that, we cannot own property here in the first place. So you can deal in riba, but you can't own property here because it's Dar al-Harb. You cannot become a citizen of this country because it's Dar al-Harb. So we should kick that excuse out of the window from the very start. Okay, if you're on peace, yes. What's that? Checking? A checking account? An interest-free checking account is okay. I'll talk about that. I'll finish the house, inshallah, the housing, and then we'll just open it to questions. I'm sure we'll talk about the bank accounts and those types of things, inshallah. Um, but the short answer is a checking, interest-free checking account is okay. But as far as the house is concerned, back to the house. In, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala condemns those who say, إِنَّمَا الْبَيْعُ مِثْلُ الْرِبَى That bay' is like riba. It's the same thing. Trade is just like riba. The way that a conventional mortgage works in essence is that you will go to a bank, you will secure a loan, you will take that loan to buy a house and you, you place your house as collateral. You place your house as, as, as collateral against that loan. If you fail to, if you default on your payments, the bank will repossess your house and take it away from you. There's absolutely no exchange there except for money. You took a loan, you use that loan, your house is collateral, everything is, will, will be taken away, auctioned off, whatever it is, foreclosed, if you're not able to pay that loan. Um, as far as an Islamic financial system, an Islamic financial system, there has to be an exchange of commodity, bayer. The company would have to fully purchase the home, assume all of its liabilities, assume all of its liabilities, and then sell it to you. And, and, and Rasulullah said, uh, لا بيعتين في بيعة, that there is no two sales in one sale. Meaning a person cannot say, look, if you give me this amount of money, I'll go purchase this house and then sell it to you. Essentially using the money you gave to me at a higher price. Okay? Before any exchange of money takes place, they have to purchase the house and sell it to you. They have to purchase the house and sell it to you. Uh, so that's the first thing that we see, which is obviously problematic sometimes. The second thing is assuming liabilities. In musharaka or murabaha, in a true sharia compliant system, they have to assume the liabilities of that house. They have to assume the loss of that house. So if the house takes a, a profit decrease, if the, the, the market value of the house goes down, then the company that's selling you the house or the person that's selling you the house should feel the effect of that just as much as you do when you're making your payments. So let's say you purchase a house for $300,000, you're making payments on that house, and then you know, you're, you're making payments to a company that purchased that house, and then later on, whenever you come to sell the house, you sell it for two eighty. You don't owe the company $300,000, you should only owe them two eighty at that point. Because as co-owners of the house, they assume liability at the same time. So this is one of obviously the key flaws that we see in the system today. As for, and by the way, uh, you know, as for, so we go to extremes sometimes also. If the word interest is on your, because what is halal in Islam is iqtisad. Iqtisad, which is installments. So aside from the whole profit and loss thing and, and, and those types of things, iqtisad, if I tell you I will sell you this Kleenex box for $10 now, or I will sell it to you over six months for twenty dollars. That is halal. That is allowed in accordance with all four madhahab. To sell something at a at a higher uh, okay, I have five minutes, I'm gonna rush. To sell something at a higher price is halal because there's exchange of goods here. You're not gonna increase. You don't say I'll sell it to you for ten dollars or twenty dollars over six months, but if you can't pay in six months, then I'm gonna I'm gonna charge you a nine percent interest rate and a late fee, and mark it up, and mark it up, and mark it up. No, but you can set a price from the very start. So a company can come and buy a house for $300,000, and tell you, I will sell it to you uh, with, at the same rate of a conventional mortgage of 3.3% or whatever it is, so it will end up being $320,000 over 15 years. No strings attached, I own the house, so I'll sell it to you. We compute that, that comes out to 
uh, $320,000 or whatever it is, I'll sell it to you for three twenty. dollars That's fine. That's halal. That's iqtisad. Even if it says in the contract the word interest, that's fine. Okay, so we have to be fair with the Islam. We always jump on the Islam. I also have my issues, very severe disagreements with the Islamic companies. That's not one of the objections. The word interest is not one of the objections. The problem though is whenever they give you two contracts, fill out this contract for the conventional mortgage and then fill this one out, say, you know, basically which just redefines the equation. But it's the exact same thing. That's a serious issue. At the, it's the, so you, you fill out the conventional mortgage, your company will actually belong to Freddie Mac. But here, you can fill this one out too, to make yourself feel better. That's like Bani Israel putting out their fishnets on Saturday, on Yom Sabt, on the Sabbath. It's the same thing. We'll just redefine the equation so that we can Islamicize it. That is not permissible. There has to be exchange. They have to buy the house, assume the assets, liabilities, and sell it to you. Okay? Um, unfortunately, I think sometimes we don't put our companies to, to the proper... When, whenever you want to buy something, you need to check its Sharia compliance. Uh, one other halal alternative, and this is, this is something the scholars disagree with, uh, disagree upon. The majority of scholars in this country say it's okay is to buy a foreclosed home directly from the bank at an installment price. So, so for example, Chase Bank owns a home, it's on foreclosure, they sell you the home for $280,000. It's not permissible for me to go and secure a loan from another company or another bank because that, crea that, that creates the wheel again that redefines the whole wheel. But if I make a deal with Chase Bank, okay, you're selling it for two eighty, I'll give you two sixty over 15 years. Chase Bank owns the house and they're selling you the house. So even... Uh, uh, al Majma al Fiqiyah, the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, which is a very qualified fatwa issuing body, the Assembly of Muslim Jurists of America, they said that that is permissible. If you're buying directly from the bank, there's only two contracting parties and you have a set installment price, that would be permissible. So there has to be buying and selling, a true purchase and a true sale. It cannot be just on paper, it has to be a true purchase and a true sale. And uh, you should do your homework on these companies. You really should do your homework on these companies because some of the major companies are really just playing games. At the same time, I don't say that we should just forget about the whole Islamic uh, finance thing and just say, you know what, let's just, whatever, let's just rent or buy. Con because it has become, where, you know, it's gotten to a point where people will exercise purchasing homes. So it's important for us to try to find Islamic alternatives, but also, Especially, you know, sister mentioned at the beginning, she said riba is usually a talk for men. I was so happy, so, so happy whenever I, f I found out I was giving a lecture on riba to sisters because the sisters can sway the household, inshallah, exercise your, your, uh, you know, your power over the husband and keep on, you know, if he tries to go for something that's haram, you get on him and you jump him and you say, I will not accept to live in a haram home. I will not accept that your income is haram. I will not accept this money that is riba. Um, a final note, which is very, very important. Um, a final note, if you, have an, if you happen to accidentally incur some interest, some riba, you should give it in charity. It's not going to count as charity, but at the same time you get rid of it. Even if it's 13 cents, if you incur some form of riba on your bank account, you should try to, and by the way, there isn't a single bank, I promise you, there isn't a single bank that if you insist upon an interest-free account, that will not give you an interest-free account. I've done it with, I've been with three different banks, okay, because I've, I've moved, I've switched banks. Each and every single one said, oh, we can't do that. Talk to the manager, tell them, well, okay, I'll just have to go to another bank then, that will work with me. Then they'll call the supervisor, they'll take off the interest off of your account. So insist upon it. You have to insist upon it. Even if it's going to take you an extra hour of your life, you have to insist upon it so that you don't incur riba on your account. But if you happen to incur some riba, then you should give it to charity. It does not have to go towards something filthy. Okay, because some people, they, they say that, well, if you give off this riba, then you should make sure no one eats a riba. No one eats amwal riba. That is a literal understanding of the hadith, but it's not the proper way to understand it. Because in any haram money, any haram money, it is haram for you, halal for other than you. This is a qaida in fiqh, an axiom in fiqh, haram li nafsihi, halal li ghayr. It is haram for you, halal for other than you. 
So for example, if a person has dealt with riba their entire lives, as the scholars say, if a person has dealt with riba his entire life, and then he passes away and his children inherit from him, all of the money they took is halal. Because they acquired it through a halal means, which was from the inheritance. But the, he will still be punished for dealing in riba. Okay? Likewise, if someone... So there's two types of haram money here. Um, I have, I'll take one more minute inshallah ta'ala. There's two types of haram money. There's haram money that is haram as in seized. So someone stole something. So if someone stole money through dhulm, no matter who gets it, it still needs to be returned to its rightful owner. Then there's haram money that has improper sources, interest, alcohol, whatever it may be. That money falls under the qa'idah faqiyah, haram li nafsi, halali ghayri, that it is haram for him and halal for other than him. Okay, it is haram for him and halal for other than him. Even I know that sometimes we use, just to, to show the importance of giving from our pure sources, uh, for example, in building masajid. Yes, it's important we should give from our pure sources to build masajid, things of that sort. But you cannot say that it is haram to accept money from a person who has a grocery store or deals in riba to build a masjid. Because using the incident of Abu Jahl announcing to the Quraysh before Islam, announcing to Quraysh before Islam, that whoever builds, uh, or now when we rebuild the Kaaba, let not your money come from you know, prostitution or interest or whatever it may be. It has to come from pure sources. There is not a single scholar in the history of Islam that uses Abu Jahl as tashri'a, as legislation. So ethically speaking, yes, we take the ethical message of that, that yes, you know, Abu, even Abu Jahl said when you build a masjid, build it with pure sources. But from a fiqhi perspective, you cannot, there's nowhere in Quran, hadith, sahaba, a shara' min qabl that comes what Abu Jahl said. <laughs> It doesn't exist as, as, as a form, as a source of legislation. So we use it to encourage people to give from their best sources for the barakah, but at the same time, we don't say it's haram to accept money for uh, an Islamic project, for example, because they dealt in interest or they dealt in alcohol. That's their sin before Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The way that it was taken was a permissible thing. So lastly, I remind everyone that, you know, try your best to deal in halal in whatever way that you can. It will benefit you in dunya, it will benefit you in akhirah, inshaAllah. Push your households towards halal. Uh, that way, um, there will be more blessing in that, inshaAllah. Um, uh, Imam al-Shaybani, rahimahullah, the great Hanafi scholar, Imam Muhammad al-Shaybani, Abu al-Hasan al-Shaybani, his students asked him, they said, how come you never wrote a book on taskiyah? Imam al-Shaybani was one of the great scholars of Az-Zuhd wa Raqaiq, the heart softeners and Tazkiyah. But he never wrote a book on Tazkiyah. He authored many books in the Hanafi fiqh. He offered the most comprehensive fiqh manual, Al-Mabsut, of Hanafi fiqh. But they said, you never authored a book on Tazkiyah. He said, yes I did. I wrote Kitab al the book of trade. And that is the greatest book of Tazkiyah. Because a person who learns how to trade in halal will be successful in purifying himself. So we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to purify us inshallah, to purify our income, to purify us from all of the, the dust of riba and all of the sins, the major and the minor sins. Allahumma ameen. Jazakumullah khayran. Inshallah ta'ala. If, if I said anything wrong, then please forgive me. If I said anything right, falhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Uh, I'll go to questions now inshallah.